Hey guys, it's Ben. Today we are going to work on tearing down a Whirlpool Cabrio dryer that is not heating. So we are going to go through everything there is possible on this style dryer to figure out why it went heat or maybe some other problems since we're going to have it tore apart anyway. This style is a little bit different than some of the other Whirlpools we've worked on so far. This one does not have any sort of dryer door in the upper right corner. The dryer door is instead found inside the drum itself in the lower portion when you open the door. This is a style that Whirlpool has made a lot of lately that are either Cabrios or Maytag Bravos, or even I think uh, there's a Kenmore model that uh, maybe Oasis that uses the same style heating unit and disassembles quite a bit differently than some of the other Whirlpools. This style is what you would call front accessible, meaning that it comes apart from the front, similar to a Samsung, or rather a Samsung is similar to a Whirlpool Cabrio. But the parts are pretty easy and cheap to install, and our sponsor LFOBB has provided us a few parts to uh, get this unit up and running. Now, before you actually start to take apart the dryer, it's very, very important that you shut the power off to the unit first. But one thing to remember is that if this type of unit does not heat, it could be something involved with the electricity on the unit that could cause it not to heat at all. You are needing to get 240 volts to this unit to make sure that it works. So if you have a multimeter, you can use it to check the back of the unit to verify that you get 240 volt electricity to the unit. And if you do not get 240 volt electricity to the unit from the power cord to the dryer itself, then you are not going to get heat. It does absolutely require 240 volts or at least something close to that. 200 and ups should work not as efficiently as you would want, but it will work to heat the unit. Anything less, you'll typically see a dead leg to where you only get 120 volts. And if that is the problem, you have an electrical issue and it's not the dryer, which is good and bad. And you can usually solve that by recycling the breaker, or it could be something in the power receptacle or even the dryer cord could be damaged going to the unit. That's why you always wanna check the terminal block first and then go from there. And if you check the terminal block and you find that there's nothing wrong, then it's time to look at taking apart this sort of dryer. And we're gonna start with the console first and go from there. To start on this unit, we only need two things. To take off the interface, we are only just going to use a flathead screwdriver. I have an Irwin 9-in-1 here, which is really, really great. And if you need a screwdriver, I do have it in the comments. The only other thing I'm using is going to be a putty knife, or at least I think I'm going to need one later in the video. So if you don't have a putty knife, go grab one at Walmart, or if you're ordering a screwdriver, may as well get this one from Amazon too, but it's just the generic. To remove the console top, two screws hold the entire assembly into place. One long screw on each side of the unit. Using a Phillips head screwdriver, you'll take the screws off one by one. Once out, you can push the console forward and up to unattach the console from the cabinet, exposing the control board. Some styles of dryers, you may need to insert a putty knife from the front to press on the clips to detach the console, but we did not need to do it on this unit. With the console top off, I have the technician's manual here, which shows you how to throw the unit into diagnosis. You have the interface and interface board here. And the part we're gonna be looking at the most right now is going to be this computer interface that is on the back of the unit. Here we are simply using a quarter inch hex head drive on the screwdriver to remove one screw. Once this is done, a small plastic tab needs pressed in the middle of the metal housing to remove the board. Here's the board without any of the wires on it. We're going to pop the tabs here either with the flat head of a screwdriver or you can use a knife or some sort of other item. I didn't like that plastic piece anyway. So here's the inside of the board on a typical Cabrio dryer. From the front side, you're not really gonna be able to see much of any sort of damage or failure. But if you notice, there are approximately six tabs on this unit. If you can get and remove all the six tabs, which are located here, 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 and here. If you can get all those tabs depressed, you can pop this board out to look for any sort of damage on the underside where the relays are. These 
relays here are typically vulnerable to heat damage, which will end up destroying the relays, causing the board not to work for heat or not to turn on at all. So real quick, I'm going to see if I can take this apart. I'm going to just use the flat head of the screwdriver, press down, and then And after popping the board, here's what you're going to see. There are, is no damage here on any of the pins, so go ahead and use this as a reference. Typically, you're going to find most of the damage, if any, right approximately here in this area. Um, sometimes you'll see burn marks, or you may find one of these small solder points totally desoldered and needs put back in. You can either replace the entire board or you can learn to use a soldering gun and just get these resoldered. Typically the relays are pretty cheap and you can fix these boards for under $10 using a solder kit or you can decide to go ahead and just replace it, but you may spend anywhere from $150 up to $300 to replace the board. But assuming the board's okay, we're just going to put it back in the way that we did, making sure all the wires are in the right areas, but on a board like this, they're pretty all self-explanatory in terms of collars and matching because they're all harnesses. They will only go in one and only one way. From here, we're going to go ahead and start the disassembly of a dryer. All we are going to need to do is open the top of the unit up using this putty knife. All we have to do is press the clips on the side and we should be able to get access to the unit. You may have to open the door to get it open, but otherwise it's pretty easy. And there we go. We have the drum now open. You wanna make sure that the top of the lid doesn't go all the way back just hanging. You wanna brace it against something. This is a pretty close brace to where it's at a 90 degree angle. A lot of the time you can't get it that perfect, but in this case, we're working with what we got. To go forward, taking the front of the unit off, there is three things we need to pay attention to. The screws holding the front of the bulkhead on, which there's one there and then another unit there. We also want to take the wire harness off that holds the door on. Always make sure that when you take this off, you put the it back on when you put the front of the unit on. You're gonna need either a quarter inch or a 5 16th drive on your screwdriver. Again, we got a nine and one here, so it really doesn't matter. We can just swap it out real quick to figure out what screw we need to use. Now the screw here may either be a 5 16 or a quarter inch. I've seen people replace them differently. Usually they're 5 16 but since we have a six and one here, it's not going to matter. It has a drive for both sizes. In the case of this Cabrio dryer, we're using a 5 16 hex drive on the screwdriver. Once both screws are removed, taking off the harness for the door switch can be difficult with a large screwdriver. So instead, I opted to use the putty knife, which made it much easier. With both screws removed, taking the door off is easy as simply rolling the door forward, then up and away. Make sure to pay attention to the small metal catches at the very bottom of the metal housing because these are where the front face of the door sets on and you don't want to bend them, making it difficult to put the door on later. The bulkhead is held on by a total of six screws, four on the bulkhead itself and two at the very bottom of the blower housing at the very bottom of the casing. You can technically leave the top two screws of the bulkhead on to slide them, but in the case of this unit, I totally removed them. Also, make sure you unclip the moisture sensor in the lower right corner before you remove the door fully. If all the proper screws are off, the bulkhead is extremely easy to remove, and sometimes the weight of the drum will push the bulkhead forward and off the casing, making its removal extremely quick, and you have to watch out to possibly catch it. To remove the drum belt from the idler pulley, you'll want to push the idler pulley toward the casing to give up some slack on the belt, allowing you to remove it from the motor spindle. This isn't always the easiest thing to do with one hand and a camera, but is not very difficult to do if you have two hands, however, it is a very tight space inside the drum. To remove the drum, 
simply use the belt, assuming it's intact, to pull up and out on the drum through the slots in the cabinet in the middle of the unit. Quickly, we want to inspect the idler pulley to make sure it's intact on this unit. If there is any damage to the pulley wheel, the assembly itself, or the spring, it could cause issues preventing the unit from turning on or running properly. These are the internal components of the Cabrio dryer. Yours may look slightly different in layout, but the major components are going to operate the same and have the very similar, if not the same values to test if they are good or bad. Always double check and make sure that if you need to replace a component, you're matching the right one to your style dryer. We're going to start the diagnosis of the heat system on this with grabbing a multimeter. This is my multimeter here and it is one I got from Amazon maybe two years ago, and it works amazing. It has all the functions I need, and it's only about $28. So if you don't have a multimeter, you wanna buy one before you really start diagnosing a machine fully. Otherwise, you may start replacing parts that don't need to be replaced, and you may not get to what you truly need to do with the part replacement until you have one of these. So make sure to buy one before you do anything. $28 and I've had this for two years and I've been super happy with it. So we're going to hope that that stays there and you can kind of see what's going on. This is the thermal fuse on the unit. Sometimes, most of the time, your entire Cabrio or Bravos dryer will not operate if this is dead. So what you're going to do is take the wires off and make sure you have a continuity function on the multimeter. So basically what that means is you want to check and make sure this changes from the open line, which means it's there's no electrical signal, to making sure you get something. Now with this ETAC multimeter, as long as you touch those leads together, you get a beeping noise. So if there's a beeping noise, it means it's good. And there we go. It's good. Hopefully you can see this. And you'll notice that it does report some sort of data telling you that it's good. So that's good. You're going to plug it back in. So your thermal fuse is okay. The next part that we're going to here is the thermistor. This controls the heat or at least reports the heat back to the control board if something is right or wrong. If this is bad, it usually won't be dead. It will just be reporting a bad value. What this does is it changes the ohms resistance rating on your multimeter. So you're going to change it to ohms resistance, which is this little omega symbol. And you're going to take the leads off and then simply use your prongs to see what gets reported. It won't report a low value. It will report something much higher. And when you have the techni technician's manual out, it will show you exactly what range you're supposed to get. So on this, try to do two things at once here. So we are going to get a value of about 12.52, 12.53. Depending on the value that you get back, this will either be right or wrong. In our case, given the temperature of about 70 degrees where we're at, we, it is fine. Now, if you pay attention to this chart that we're showing right now, you'll know that if it's wrong. Generally, you want plus minus 5% from this value. So if you're at 12,450 ohms, you probably want it within about 500 ohms. And if it's much outside that, replace it. Generally, if this is bad, it's going to be a very radical value. Say 20,000 or 5,000, and that's how you'll know it's wrong. Or it may not report anything back, and you definitely know it's wrong. Now, you can't use the continuity function on this setting because you have to have typically a high resistance value. You notice there, I'm not getting anything, and I got the continuity feature. So using the continuity feature, you won't get anything, even if it still works. So we're going to go ahead and put those leads back on the way we found them. If you do have to replace the thermistor, you're simply going to unscrew the two screws here and replace it with the new set. These are 5 8 screws on everything, which is kind of abnormal, but you're just going to take your screwdriver and unscrew it. Okay. 
and it will come off the dinner plate. Now the reason I've taken it off with the wires is typically what I like to do is when I transport from a bad thermistor over to a new one, I like to keep all the wires on so I can put them over to the new one in the exact correct position. But this one's okay, so we're just going to put it back on. One thing to check for on this style of dryer, this unit is extremely notorious for having this nice little hole, which is where the blower housing is. It likes to get impacted with huge, huge amounts of lint or other debris. Now this one's extremely clean, but that is because we've already cleaned it out. If your unit is getting warm in the dryer drum, but you are not getting your clothes dry, this is usually the culprit. I don't know what happened when Whirlpool made this, but it is very, very prone to getting a ton of lint in it. Even if you do a good job replacing the lint and the lint filter, this will still get impacted and screw up. But it's pretty easy to clean out once you got the front off. So make sure that if you have this unit un hooked everything here make sure you get that cleaned out otherwise you may replace a sensor only to have that go bad shortly thereafter now we are at the heating unit itself if you haven't found anything that prevents the unit from heating this chances are is something that is going to be going bad you have your heating element here your thermostat here with multiple moderator wires on it and then finally the thermal cutoff each of these, if they go bad, can cause your unit not to heat. So again, you want your all-important multimeter on a continuity setting to be able to go through every component on this heater and test it and see if any of them are bad. Um, to do this, you don't really need to have all the wires off. As long as you have one wire off, it will prevent back feeding from giving you false positives, for example, on the heating element. So as long as one of the wires is off, you should be okay for testing. And again, we got on continuity with the, uh, the alarm button, which means you have a signal. So all we got to do here is test for a signal. And that is good. And we're reporting approximately 10 ohms resistance on the heater can, which is what you want it to be. Roughly 10 plus minus 10%. Now, one catch with this unit that can cause you to have issues is if the can is what's called burned or grounded out. And what that means is the wire that actually heats the unit could be touching the canister, which would start it to run at a bad time and cause all kinds of issues. So again, you take the two leads and you simply tap them onto a spade terminal on the element and then anywhere on the canister. You can test it on multiple different places, and the idea is you don't get any sort of continuity or a noise or anything. That means that your heating element is not grounding out and touching the can. If that happens, you could get insufficient heat, or it could uh, burn up something in the unit, which you definitely don't want. It's pretty rare for it to ground out, but I've seen it enough times to know that you have to look for it. Make sure the wires go back on the same exact way you had them. And since this is a cluster, we want to make sure that we get a picture of all of this unit, which we are displaying, to make sure that you know exactly how these wires go on. On the thermostat, you're going to have two wires that are here that mainly deal with the heat, and then an additional moderator wire which reports information back up to your power system, or rather your control board. So this actually daisy chains into your element here, and then this other wire, the black wire, comes in here to your, therm your thermal cutoff. So if this goes bad, it could cut heat going off to your element. Again, take one wire and remove it. Go ahead and keep your multimeter on continuity. And then you're going to check and see if you get continuity with the beep or any sort of data reporting. And we're getting a good value. Everything is fine there. This is a special thermostat that does have that moderator housing. Otherwise, it would be a generic, element, uh, a generic thermostat and they're not too expensive to change, but this is a little bit special. Finally, we're dealing with the thermal cutoff here. 
Oftentimes, I have found that this is what is bad, maybe even more frequently than the element itself. If this is bad, it's a telltale sign that there may be something else wrong with your system. This is a heating moderator of last resort. If this dies, if it gets too hot, it means that the heater can has gotten too hot and it has caused this to trip, killing heat to your unit. If this is bad, I would always replace the thermostat and then make sure the unit is free of lint both inside and outside the unit because if, they're, if the unit gets too hot because of too much lint buildup, this has a tendency to pop. In my experience, 30 to 50% of the time that you don't get heat on a unit of this style, it's the, the thermal cutoff, which is a pretty cheap fix. We're gonna go ahead and take our multimeter yet again, and we're gonna keep it on the same setting. So all these heat settings on this can have been the exact same thing. We are just checking for continuity. Again, we're just listening for the sound and we're pulling one wire off. It doesn't matter which one it is. Either one is fine. And we are just checking the leads, which is not the easiest on this because it's how it's routed, but we're just checking for that. And we are good again there. And if any of these do not get the right tones, it's bad and you'll need to replace it. To replace the sensors, it's pretty straightforward. There is a screw here and then one at the bottom and you will take the leads off to get access to that lower one. If you can help it, I have a tendency to try to unscrew them and then put the wires back on so they match properly. The key though, is making sure that one of the wires comes up from the thermostat down to your element. If you wire it wrong and you have a wire that does not go from the thermostat to the element, it's not gonna work. Likewise, this is extremely straightforward. There are simply two screws, top and bottom, and you're just gonna take the 3 16 or actually the quarter inch on your screwdriver, and then simply take them out. And it's pretty straightforward on how to do that. To remove the heating element from this unit, you only need to remove one screw to be able to access the whole heater can. And it's this quarter inch screw right here. Generally, your screwdrivers are not going to cut it unless you want to wiggle this metal piece, make it flush so you can stick something straight down in. Or you could just use a ratchet. And this is like a really, really cheap ratchet, I want to say from Menards. But if you don't have one, you can always order one from Amazon in the link below. So all we're going to do is take this and... So all we're going to do is take this and unscrew this quarter inch screw. And it is out. From here, you can literally just pull the entire heat canister out since the screw is now removed. There is an additional screw inside that holds this whole plate on, so this plate's going to be attached this entire time, um, but to at least pull the canister out, you just need the one screw. So. Now, with the element removed, here's where things can get a little bit dicey. There are two styles of Cabrio or Bravos heating elements that I've seen, and depending on the style that you need, the process of removal is a little bit different. This is the kind that is in the unit itself. It features a clamshell design, which is held in by screws that I have already removed. You have to remove one, two, three, four, and then you have another two on the other side. And they're typically Phillips screws, but sometimes I've seen quarter inch. And this is what I call a clamshell design. And that's just the term I use for it. Once you open it up, you have the heating element in there and you simply take it out and put the new one in. Now, in order to crimp it, you do have these spade connectors here that are held on both by this Phillips head screwdriver screw here, which I don't think you have to remove, but it's held in by these microscopic small spade connectors on this style. You need to take a small pair of pliers and bend them out, and then that will give you access to just remove the heating element itself. So again, what you'll do is just simply take those undone and remove them and this whole unit will come out and you're done. The other style heat canister is a single piece unit. Externally, it looks pretty similar and I've already removed some of the sensors. This is a slightly older style with an older type thermostat in it. There's no moderator wire, but the heating element itself looks pretty dang similar 
with the front cover removed. On this style, and this was the style I was wanting to focus on, it's all held in by a single screw. You take this screw out and you can pull the entire unit away and you're done. catch of course is this can be pretty rough to actually pull out and can take a little bit of sweat equity. Of course I have a ratchet extension so I can be very stupid with this. And it's out. And there we go. So you're simply going to take your new one, preferably from LFOBB, and you're just going to simply install it the same way you took it out. It's pretty narrow, so you're just going to shove the new one into the canister and reinstall the canister, and you are good to go. Now, if you've gotten to this point that you've ripped everything else apart in this machine, you checked every sensor, maybe you've replaced a part or two that you thought was bad and you're still not getting heat, and you checked the wires to make sure that they're good, it's probably time to call in a professional. Um, other things that could be wrong with this type of machine could be somewhere on the motor itself. There could be a motor switch that's gone bad, a centrifugal switch has gone bad, um, maybe the belt, or there's a wire that's loose somewhere in the unit that you're going to have to chase down. And you can use your multimeter to test continuity between wire and wire to make sure there's nothing dead. Um, if you were super advanced, you could use live electricity and see why you're not getting 120 volts somewhere in the heating element itself or going from the control board to the heater itself to try to chase down where the voltage is dying at and then replacing that part. But again, at that point, you're probably not doing it as a homeowner. You need to be a professional that's comfortable around advanced tools and be willing to work on 240 electricity, which may or may not kill you. So with all that, we're going to go ahead and put the unit back together, starting with the drum and working our way backwards to getting the unit ready to run and hopefully fixed. Putting the Cabrio dryer back together is pretty straightforward. Set the drum on the rollers in the back of the dryer housing and install the dryer belt onto the idler pulley. This isn't always easy due to the tight space between the housing and your hands, but after a few tries this is how it should go in regards to looping the belt around the idler pulley itself. With the belt and pulley installed, make sure the moisture sensor is plugged back in place when you put the bulkhead back on, which secures again with six screws. There will be some difficulty in getting the drum to line back up with the bulkhead, but I found that if you turn the drum slightly, it can help quite a bit to make sure the drum lines up with the rollers on the back of the bulkhead itself. The first screw or two is usually the most difficult, so if you are able to keep the top two screws installed on the slotted part of the bulkhead, it may make it a little bit easier, but it wasn't required in this situation because I had no problem installing the bulkhead without the slotted screws. You'll now take the door and set it on the front of the dryer. By far the most difficult part is lining up the door with the small attaching points on the lower corners of the dryer and it may take some time to properly align these small clips with the door itself. Next, reinstall the two 5 16th screws on the top of the dryer and don't forget to put the wire harness back on for the door switch as well. Once you've gotten this far, and both screws are installed, you can now simply close the top of the dryer and you now have the unit back together fully. And there we go. It's back together and we have hopefully figured out what was wrong in your machine to get this up and running. Yours may look a little bit different than this one when it comes to a Whirlpool, Maytag, or a Kenmore, but as long again as the lint trap is the same underneath, it's going to come apart pretty similar to this one. The bulkhead is the same, the heating element may have slight differences in it, but generally they're not too hard to take apart and find out what's wrong with them. But again, if you've done all these steps and still can't figure out what's wrong, call a tech. But I hope that this video has been able to help you hopefully troubleshoot what's going on. If you did not get anything figured out, like and subscribe to the channel, and then leave a comment below if you couldn't figure out what was going on with your unit. With any help or with any luck, I may be able to help you figure out what's going on. Hopefully, this helped you out. If not, we'll see you next time.